All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, we are just letting people kind of fill in here. We are so excited to have Pamela grow with us today, um, talking about charting your first 100 days with a new development director. So we had a pretty phenomenal response here um, of people signed up today. So we're gonna give them a couple of minutes to um, come on in. But uh, while we're waiting, uh, go ahead and um, open up that chat box and uh, let us know where you are um, dialing in from today. Um, we'd love to uh, hear uh, you know, where, you're, where you're coming in from. For those of you that have just joined, we're gonna start the presentation here in just a couple of minutes. Pamela, how are you doing this morning? I am doing awesome. Thank you, Josh. Oh, fantastic. Well, how about you? I'm doing great. Look at this. The chat here is blowing up uh, all oh, wow. audience, out by me. We have Philadelphia or over in your neck of the woods. Um, I can't even. Bucks County, Portland. Oh. Yeah, Bucks is near you, right? It is. I will have to put in a plug for the uh, the food truck. The food truck. There you go. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll talk, what, what's your connection? You we were talking before everyone hopped on here. Uh, you're connected to a food truck in Philadelphia. What What is that food truck? Tell us a little bit more about it. Bur burrito, burrito Feliz. It is a food truck that my daughter manages. And um, last year they got Best Beria, Best of Philly. Oh, and cool. their, their tacos are absolutely epic. There you go. You got Yusuf Khan just dialed in from Philadelphia. So Yusuf, you know, uh, check out uh, that food truck if you happen to uh, like come to Oktoberfest. And oh, okay, oh, we got some promotion going on here. Portland, Oregon. Uh, <laughs> Dana, the sound isn't working. Uh, we will have um, our colleague Sarah reach out to you and, and troubleshoot. You may want to dial in. Sometimes that fixes it. Um, so if you go down to the control and click the little mute button or that little icon about I'm dialing in, you can, you can try that. Uh, Winnipeg, Montana, oh, uh, fantastic. Long Beach, Sarasota. All right, uh, Omaha, all right, phenomenal. Well, so many people, but um, we are two minutes past the hour and we have a ton of content that Pamela has prepared. So I wanna make sure that we have time to do that. So I'm gonna sort of kick us off here. I'm gonna walk us through some just housekeeping things and then we will, um, hand it over to Pamela. So before we get started, uh, the presentation is being recorded. Um, and so uh, we will be sending a link to view that recording out um, later this day, uh, later this day, later today, <laughs> as well as the slides. Um, so if you are looking for those, just know that we will be able to uh, get those to you um, later today or uh, tomorrow at the latest. Uh, with, request, with regards to questions, if you have a specific question for Pamela, please use the Q&A button. So like down on that Zoom control panel, click the Q&A button. That was where we're going to collect all of the questions and then Pamela will um, be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So use that Q&A. Chat, um, we will be kind of keeping an eye on the questions in chat, but if you really want to make sure that your question is answered, uh, make sure you put that in the question Q&A section, um, not the chat, all right? And then for those of you that I haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name is Josh Meyer. I'm the VP, um, one of the VPs of marketing over at Bloomering. We are so thrilled that you have decided to join us this afternoon, or I guess if you're with me in the, on the West Coast this morning, uh, we are thrilled that you are with us. Um, just a little bit about Bloomerang. Bloomerang is um, a donor management and online fundraising tool. Uh, we would love to have the opportunity to connect with you and your team if there um, is an opportunity to help you and your fundraising staff uh, just to get more out of your data and to better manage the relationships that you have with your constituents. Um, I think Pamela may be talking a little bit about retention today uh, as it relates to donors, or I'm sorry, <laughs> donor development directors. Um, we focus a lot on retention on how you can retain your donors um, using Bloomerang, but also just using best practices. Um, there's a lot of uh, fundraising best practices built in Bloomerang. So enough about Bloomerang. Uh, it is now my pleasure to hand over um, the Zoom to Pamela Grow. She's the founder of Grow Consulting. I'm based uh, just outside of Philadelphia. And uh, Pamela, I'll go ahead and uh, hand it over to you and let you introduce yourself. So I'm gonna stop the share and we'll make oh, sure awesome. to pick it up. Let us. me see. All right. Awesome. Perfect. 
Hey, thanks everybody. Thanks for being here today. I mean, my gosh, it's the middle of it's it's almost the end of August. A lot of lot of folks are on vacation. Um, either that or you're super busy with your year end fundraising. So I really appreciate that you took the time to be here today. And and um, Josh, is is it okay if I actually take myself off camera? Sure. If you want, Just yeah. because I find it a little distracting. Uh, yeah, that works. So whether you're a brand new development director or a new fundraising executive director, you're going to emerge from today's training with focus and a plan for what to do now for the most impact. And if you stay with me till the end, although I think you can grab these from the handouts, I'm not sure you'll get these, these handouts to really implement what you learned today. I always like to say this because I know my own, my own habit of being on Twitter or maybe I'm writing an appeal letter or maybe I'm doing something else while a webinar is going on. So I'm just gonna ask you if you could turn off all distractions, that would be absolutely awesome. I know it's tough. Are you a brand new nonprofit development director and you're feeling excited, but maybe a little bit scared about where to start? Josh introduced me already, but my name's Pamela Gro. I've been working in nonprofit fundraising since 2000. Prior to that, I spent seven years working for a grant making foundation here in Philadelphia. And Basics and More has trained gosh, about 10,000 nonprofits all over the world since 2010, including Easter Seals, the Salvation Army, Embrace Race, all kinds. I've also written a book called Simple Development Systems, Successful Fundraising for the One Person Shop. And I know the power of fundraising systems and in particular, individual giving to really transform your nonprofit. And I believe strongly in you and your good work. So we talked about the Mexican food truck. That's that's my my daughter Samantha represented in that in that uh, corner down there. I have two daughters, Abigail, who's a lawyer in Philadelphia, and I live in the suburbs of the city of Philadelphia. That is my grand puppy down there on the left. I love classic movies. I love reading, museums, hiking, all kinds of stuff. And I really love baking. That is my COVID chocolate babka loaf. So how can you steer clear of the pitfalls of being the new kid on the block and avoid the all too common syndrome of fundraising turnover in small organizations? Today, you're gonna to discover how you can maximize the potential of your first 100 days on the job, create organizational change for the better, and really instill other members of your organization with a sense of trusting you. And you'll walk away, it's my hope that you'll walk away from this training with a solid plan to get up to speed quickly. This webinar is geared towards new fundraising professionals, new fundraising EDs. It's also a good refresher for consultants to nonprofits who wanna really cut through the layers of complexity and develop a results-driven fundraising plan fast. If, the, if you have been in this sector for any length of time, you know that when you first start with a new organization, especially in the, those, first, those first few years in this sector, a lot of times, I always say it takes about a year to really get your sea legs and to really understand what's going on behind the scenes. And that's the purpose of this training that you can hopefully get there a lot quicker. You, we're gonna talk about step-by-step -step what metrics you need to look at and how to put your best foot forward and how to build your new organization's culture. And most importantly, how to raise more money. So I am going to ask Sarah now to launch the poll. We got one poll for you in this webinar. I also, I really like to engage, so I'll probably be pausing the webinar a few times throughout to just kind of get your feedback on stuff. Are you a 
brand new development director or associate, a new ED or CEO, a consultant or other? Let me know. All right, they're uh, filling it out here. Um, fantastic, I think we have 82% participation. We'll wait here one or two more minutes and then Sarah, if you wanna go share the results with everyone. I always want to put the Jeopardy music in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too funny. All right. Okie doke. Oh, that's great. That's interesting. Okay. We've got 64% are brand new development directors or associates. 9% are new EDs. Only 3% are consultants and then other. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Well, congratulations on your new job. Before we get started actually in this in this session, I wanna kind of address the elephant in the room. According to un underdeveloped, 57% of development directors working at organizations with budgets under a million plan to leave their organizations, organizations within one year. 27% of small shop fundraisers plan to leave the field of development altogether, compared to 11% of the development directors at larger organizations. And I think we, we've talked about this a lot. Burnout is affecting us all. So does anyone have any guesses on the average length of tenure for a development director? You wanna just go ahead and, and type in your thoughts in the chat box. Now, can I see the chat box or do I have to actually exit my presentation? Uh, you should be able to hover over at the top where the, you have the Zoom bar and just click chat. You shouldn't have to exit the presentation, but I can read some of these out here to you. Okay. Yeah. A lot of 18 months, you have some three, six years, five years, two years, two years, three years, three years, three years, 18 months. It looks like I, if I had to quickly average these, I would say you're roughly between 18 months and three years seems to be the... Uh, yeah range and i think it depends on size too and these are these are just some of the statistics that, that i uncovered when i was preparing this presentation 24 months 18 months we've heard 18 months for for years now i think well maybe the last 10 years but according to some of the latest research from penelope burke it's it's actually closer to 16 months and we all know how hard it is to really develop real relationships when you have that kind of turnover. A quick warning. <laughs> what I'm gonna cover today is what my, my friend Mary Kalan calls, refers to as the unsexy side of fundraising. We're gonna be talking about what you really need, what you really need to have moving forward and the best direction moving forward, just so you know. And we're gonna be talking about being proactive because so often, you know it and I know it, this sector is very, very, very reactive. So how can you take control of your fundraising? How can you lead your fundraising team if you have one or even lead the rest of your team? So let's get started. This is the six steps of building a successful fundraising department. And we're gonna talk first about culture. And there's a reason for that, which we're gonna be talking about later on in this presentation, but where does the money come from? First off, we just got a brand new report from Giving USA in 2021, Americans gave $484 billion to charity, and that was a 4% increase over 2020. And where did that money come from? 67% came from individuals, and there, that was an increase. Foundation funding increased for the first time in a long time, increased to 19%. Legacy giving, 9%, and giving by 
corporations actually went down last year, I think, it, or the year before, I think it was 5%. So that means that factoring in bequest gifts, giving by individuals accounts for 76% of all philanthropic giving in the United States. And it's really important to know that. And it's an important part of your new job to make sure that everyone understands the secrets, the facts behind sustainable fundraising. You really need to make it a point to educate your board and staff and your ED and get everybody on the same page. And this is a book I've been, man, I've been re recommending this book since, you know, Josh and I were talking before we got on about John Lepp's new book, Creative Deviations. And I think it's really a transformative book, not to get off topic. For this sector, there are certain books you return to over and over and over and over again. Creative Deviations is going to be one for me. Train Your Board is something you need to have in your, in your office. Really excellent book. It's essentially a whole bunch of different exercises to, to educate your team to different aspects of fundraising. So in the handouts today, we have got 17 easy ways to lead your organization's culture shift. And one of the most important things to do is to really make a commitment to your organization's culture. Because yeah, it does take patience, it takes consistency, it takes real commitment. I usually recommend that you pick anywhere from three to five, about a handful of these that you think will work well with your organization and make it a point to implement them regularly. So what are some of the ways? This is always one of my favorites. You have a staff meeting every week or every two weeks, integrate a short training into every staff and board meeting. Schedule regular thankathons with both your board and staff. And I like to do these, I like to kind of get a feel for, for how, how my board and staff actually likes to do them because some people are more comfortable writing handwritten notes, some people are more comfortable on the phone. Shadow a member of your program staff. Maybe take a half a day to shadow a member of your program staff and find out exactly what they do. And what are some other ways? What, what are some ways, go ahead and type in the chat box. What are some ways that you, that you um, work regularly on your organization's culture? Can you read that off, Josh, if there are any? Yeah, um, we're sort of waiting here. Can, someone asked if you could explain thinkathons. What's a thinkathon? What's a thinkathon? That's when you have a you might have a board meeting and you set aside 20 minutes, half an hour to either write thank you notes or to call donors to call and thank them. Either way, you're going to be really prepared. You're going to have the list made out, the background on the donors, give each board member anywhere from five to 10 donors, depending on, you know, you'll get the hang of it as you do this more regularly. Right. Have cards ready for them to to write the handwritten thank yous. Yeah. Same with staff. Yeah, that's great. Some of the other uh, ideas here were uh, share good donor feedback with the program staff. Yes. Um, take one of the staff members to coffee once a week. Ask, yes. Yep. Ask site managers what their volunteer needs are. Report out to staff regularly. Involve staff in events. Have. Um, I think maybe it's donor appreciation mixers, uh, meet the new staff as they onboard. There's a, um, so, yeah, yeah. a lot of good ideas here. A lot of good ideas. I knew, I, I knew there would be because you have the best people, right? Yeah. Exactly. I, love, I love this quote exactly. from Brene Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Daring leadership is ultimately about serving other people, not ourselves. That's why we choose courage. So next up is discovery. And this can be kind of painful. This can really be kind of painful because you're probably going to discover some stuff you don't really want to discover. But these are the materials that I recommend you start gathering. It might take it might take you a while. 
you want your organization's written case for support. This doesn't need to be a, a fancy, um, you know, something that, that's professionally designed that was done for a capital campaign, but you need to have a strong written case for support. Something that forms the, the backing of your grant proposals, of your, of your appeals. Your organization's gift acceptance policy. This is really important too. Um, I remember I went directly from an organization serving women and children where I was literally driving out to Walmart once a week to pick up to pick up diapers for our mothers that donated diapers. And then I went to to a really progressive educational organization and right there in the gift acceptance policy we did not we did not accept gifts from Walmart. There were a list, whole list of businesses. Your organization's DEI policy and the makeup of your board. The past few years of annual reports, donor newsletters, impact reports, a breakdown of revenue by source over the past three years, any grants applied for, received, what else? A fundraising plan if available, as well as your organization's strategic plan if it's fairly recent. And they are actually, it's not collecting dust on a shelf. Think too, do you market plan giving to your donors and how do you do it? This can be something as simple as a tagline that appears on everybody's signature in the organization. That's one of the best ways to get started, believe it or not. Samples of any direct mail, hard or electronic copies of email campaigns, your organization's thank you letter and receipt. What database are you using? How are you measuring social media ROI? How are you, are you measuring it through engagement, through reach, through number of email subscribers? And the same with events. And generally speaking, how do you evaluate the success of your fundraising program? But most importantly, what is your budget? What is your budget for fundraising? Because if you don't have a budget, it is a major, major red flag. I actually came across this earlier this week, believe it or not, in a Facebook group. And I'll give you a second to read that because when I read this, I thought, you know, she's, she's not alone. And that's why the tenure tends to be 16 months. Yeah, we, we often say here, it's like, you got to spend money to make money, right? Which is where I think that- You have to spend money to make money. Yeah. Oh yeah, you got people in the chat here. We had, uh, someone said, this is my my position right now. And Molly, Molly echoes, yikes. Yeah, you need resources to succeed. Now, are there ways that you can you can kind of you know, for a really, really small organization, I mean, I've had board members um, chip in to pay for printing, chip in to pay for stamps for, for thank you notes. But yeah, you need a real budget. The next step in this process is the, what I call meet and greet. And that's where I'm going to recommend that you actually begin to meet one-on-one. -on -one. And I, I really urge you strongly to meet one-on-one -on -one with your staff, with your board members. I think it's really important to meet with each of your board members individually and even with select volunteers. And some questions that you might ask them, you, you really wanna to get to the heart of your organization. How long have you worked here? What's most meaningful to you about the work you do? Chances are it's not just a paycheck. What do you think are our biggest strengths and weaknesses and opportunities? And of course, the, the 
the the envisioning the future question. So what if Mackenzie Scott, did anybody here get a get a grant from Mackenzie Scott? What if Mackenzie Scott gave you a grant of $1 million tomorrow? How many people could you help? What would you do? What are some of our organization's best stories? What inspires you to come to work every day? What about our internal culture? Are our staff and board generally supportive of philanthropy? Hmm. Do you have any ideas for future fundraising initiatives? Do you have any ideas to share on potential funders? Can you tell me about them? Especially important with your board members because a lot of times they might have connections to foundation funders. Also, do your board members contribute financially? I know that this is a question that kind of, um, mm, there's some controversy over, but I, I do believe that all board members should contribute financially at a level that's that's meaningful to them. I'm not a big fan of, of uh, give or get where you have to give $1,000, $10,000, but at, at a level that's meaningful to them. Next up, your data. Your data is really, really your GPS. And you might feel uncomfortable digging into it. I know when I'm working with, with a brand new client, it takes me a while to kind of get the feel for their system and their donors, but you really need to dig in. How many active donors, those who have given in the past 12 months, do you have? How many lapsed donors? Really take a look at donor loyalty. This can be missing sometimes when we run reports and we're more concerned with the size of the gift rather than the fact that uh, Nana Brown has, has sent us a check every year for 20 years for $50. She's, she's prime for, uh, for a bequest. How many active donors have a last gift of 250 to 499? How many have a last gift of 500 and more? How many monthly donors do you have? And how much revenue do you receive from them every month? What is your organization's major gift threshold? And how many of those donors do you have? For a tiny little startup organization, maybe the biggest gift you've ever gotten has been $250 from an individual. For, for maybe a college or a university, it might be $10,000. $10, what is your major gift threshold? How many bequest gifts have you received in the past three years? And what's the average size? And when was your last data audit? Of course, most importantly, what is your do donor retention rate? Donor retention, when you really focus your fundraising efforts on donor retention, you will find that your fundraising costs go down over the years, which is really amazing. Um, we have lots of, lots of students and clients there their retention rate is 60% and up. And it's, your fundraising kind of flows when you get to that level. You're not constantly scrambling. And of course, online only donors have much lower retention rates. And next up, we are going to talk about your Ask, Think, Report systems. And this is a poll where I just want you to go ahead and type into the chat box, is having a strong base of general operating support important to your nonprofit? Right, let's see what we got here. All I right. always so. aim for general operating support. Even when I, when I did, uh, when I managed grant programs, um, 
Philadelphia is kind of fortunate in the fact that they are um, pretty rich in foundation funding and you could actually build a strong core of foundation grants general operating support. But I know that's not the case everywhere. A lot of foundations still don't fund general operating support. What are you uh, hearing, Josh? Oh my goodness. I think it is resounding yes. I saw 10,000%, absolutely. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, I yeah. Think, I, have, I have yet to see a no here. So I think everyone, <laughs> uh, Pamela, the, uh, the general consensus here is a hands down yes. Yeah, yeah. Even I've, I've worked with clients, you know, who, who got quite, actually the bulk of their funding came from from government grants or, or um, fee for services. And they recognize the folly of not building a base of general operating support with individuals. Your organization's individual fundraising program, raising money from individuals should form the core of your fundraising efforts. Because while you can't discount other forms of fundraising, for most nonprofits, general operating support is the very best kind of fundraising. So I'm going to walk you through a short story. And if you're, if you've been with with uh, if you've been to any of my presentations, I've been using this little story a lot. This is one donor's story. Her name is Amy. She's a 50-something lady. She never married. She is a um, She's a professor at a small liberal arts college. She owns her own home. She loves her dog, Max. She loves watching Great British Bake Off, Euphoria, and her secret guilty pleasure Hallmark Christmas movies. She likes to travel with her niece, her sister's, her sister's daughter, and she's always been really close with her. She loves the theater. She loves music. She loves cooking and entertaining and hiking and reading. She is also a donor. She believes strongly in giving back. And because of that, Amy, Amy is a donor to roughly, I, I would say she's a regular donor to about anywhere from a dozen to 20 organizations, mostly in the community. She is a monthly donor to about three organizations. She is a major donor. She has given, she has given large gifts she, she, to, to her college where she teaches. She's also given a large gift to a local theater and an animal shelter. And they don't know it yet, but the local shelter where she adopted Max will be the recipient of a $125,000 legacy gift when Amy passes away. Just for the sake of, of uh, a story, we're going to say she went to your event or she somehow became familiar with your organization. Maybe a friend of hers turned, turned her on to you and she made a gift online. By the way, Amy makes most of her gifts online, except when she's writing a bigger check. She got a receipt. And then utter silence. In the meantime, course of maybe about 10 months a year, she vacationed in Peru. She helped plan her niece's wedding. She took a French pastry making class. That sounds like fun. She made a $10,000 gift to a local arts organization. And then one super snowy day towards the end of December, your fundraising appeal landed in her mailbox. Okay, so she's like a lot of us and she sorts her mail over the recycling bin. She didn't immediately recognize the name and it went into the trash because you saw what a busy life she leads. Your organization was not at the top of her mind. And Amy is just one of hundreds, if not thousands of wonderful, wonderful donors who would love, love to support your mission. So all you have to do is make it ridiculously easy to give and then nurture the relationship. 
And you've, you've heard of, of this model. I'm not the first one to talk about it. The Simple Development Systems Fundraising Model is your organization's ask, thank, report, repeat, donor communications model. And what it really is, I don't call it your fundraising, but it's the engine behind your fundraising. It's keeping your mission, your wonderful mission, at the top of mind. It's essentially just ask, thank, report, and repeat. And with a little bit of twist, I like to put in donor feedback and engagement. So this is how simple it is. Your ask, this particular campaign consisted of um, this one two-page letter, five emails, and some Facebook posts. This is from Mandy Fisher at Intervail. This was actually at the height of lockdown. They were really, really, um, they do this Mother's Day, Mother's Day tree campaign every single year. And Mandy was really kind of nervous about sending it out in the middle of COVID, but it was, it had already been printed. She came up with a wonderful, excuse me, a wonderful little accompanying note. They did amazing. And your thank you. I always recommend it's this is this is one thing. I can guarantee you that almost every single person on this webinar today can have a better thank you. So I always recommend the Sophie Thank You Letter Clinic. Wait, stop, wait a minute. Just any thank you? No, you really need to learn how to say thank you. It's, it's pretty much, especially right now, your, your whole fundraising program should be centered around thank you. This is from a study from um, Jen Shang, Adrian Sargent. They found that those who received the thank you gave an average of $45 more the next ask than those who did not receive the thank you. And this is really cool research. I think you've had Jen Chang on, haven't you? She's so amazing. Um, the good feeling of thank you lasts for almost three months. And I love this quote from Ken Burnett. The simple fact is that an appropriate thank you letter, it's really your best fundraising opportunity of all. I can remember actually my very first job in fundraising. And once I, once I had a plan, I sat down and worked that plan. And, and then the checks started to come in from proposals I'd written from appeal letters. And I remember the first foundation check that came in and I thought, oh shoot, I have to write a thank you letter. What a terrible attitude, huh? You get to write a thank you letter. Your report. We are big on um, print donor newsletters, but how are you showing the impact your supporter's gift makes possible? You can do it through a one-page impact update, maybe your donor newsletter with a personal note, personal thank you update call, an impact email, or maybe a series of emails your annual report, rinse and repeat. That's all there is to it. So what does that actually look like? This is a sample donor communications plan from one of our students. They do four multi-channel campaigns a year, three print donor newsletters, and those only go to donors one annual report just because thank you. And they actually do two monthly giving, I'm sorry, four monthly giving campaigns a year. And these are segmented and they're highly targeted. And a monthly e-newsletter. This is kind of similar to they're asking more. Uh, 
Oh, and I wanted to share real quick. This was an organization, Jody Joy O'Keefe. Um, gosh, she's been with us for a long time. She does amazing fundraising. She was with this organization that was all event focused. And she started weaning them off events. And just, I think it was just last year, she started this monthly giving program. Mailed the invitation to 250 supporters. They brought in 16 new monthly donors. And that's interesting enough because most of their most of their giving is done by check. But about 50% came in through um, came in online. You can see that having strong multi-channel works for every single age group. Even very young donors respond to direct mail and your best donors, they really respond. So what's up next? What now? You've got all that information together. Now you wanna start thinking about your plan. And it can be really, really, really distracting to be working in fundraising right now because you are being marketed to by not only so many individuals, but so many software companies. And I have to tell you that Bloomerang are, are I always, always recommend Bloomerang's webinars because they are the best in the industry. But I know, you know, TikTok can look exciting. Um, Instagram can look exciting. What you really need to talk about first is your plan. And I think you guys have had Barbara O'Reilly on too, haven't you? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm a big Barbara O'Reilly fan. Having... She is awesome. She yeah. is awesome. So in 2020, Barbara O'Reilly and Adrian Sargent had a survey on the topic of fundraising planning. The results found that those organizations having a written fundraising plan far out outperformed those without a plan. I know it's kind of like, duh, but, but yeah. And one of the most critical factors, this is why we start with culture. One of the most critical factors in whether you, the plan was actually implemented or not was the organization's culture. I think you had Clay Buck on too, right? I love Clay Buck. Yeah, Clay and I were hanging out last week at the, uh, at the Arizona conference. Oh, that? he's such a peach. Your yeah. fundraising plan is your commitment to your organization, your community, and your donors on how you'll fulfill your mission. I just love that statement. It's so true. So you, when you're creating your plan, I do have a template for a plan if you'd like one. You want to think about how you're creating SMART goals. And SMART goals are really simple, sm specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. And that can be something as simple from, say, say it's your plan to double your monthly donors in 2022. That's pretty vague, right? Double our monthly donors by November of 2023, by way of one direct mail campaign, three digital campaigns, and adding donate monthly buttons to all email communications. Now that's a smart goal. So maybe you feel alone in your work too, but what would it feel like to work in an organization where everyone understood that fundraising really is everyone's responsibility. One of the most critical factors is the culture. You get that culture right and, and everything else will, will start to flow. So definitely grab that handout. This Mandy is someone, I met her, I'm gonna say about seven, eight years ago. She had started with her organization. She actually moved, moved to Vermont to start with her organization. And if I'm not mistaken, I think she had um, 
she started as develop in development and then she found out that she was like the third in two years something like that and so she went in and she really transformed the culture she started with the culture mandy is still there she's doing killer killer work for intervale center she's amazing and you might be thinking are you still with me <laughs> because i told you this was the unsexy part of fundraising but pam what about raising money my organization wants results now i got some ideas for how you can in the midst of all this interviewing people and collecting all the data you need ways that you can raise some money quickly if you have a monthly giving program growing it quickly with a dedicated monthly giving campaign is one of your absolute easiest wins if you're not already um if you're interested in growing your monthly giving program definitely subscribe to erica wasdorp's weekly newsletter I also recommend that everyone has something similar to this, where you can actually empower your supporters to raise money on your behalf. This is a guide. I think if you go to soydogfoundation.org, it's actually just soydog.org, excuse me. Um, they've got all these different ways that people have raised money for soy dog, you know? encourage your supporters to start who needs a birthday present these days Emp empower them to start a facebook fundraiser on your behalf show them how step by step screenshot every single step add another campaign you're doing one year end campaign or maybe two campaigns add in a third or a fourth Consider surveying part of your donor base. Now, this is my very first job. I landed in an organization. Um, they had had a development director, but after about two weeks of real digging, I found out that she literally hadn't done anything for five years. They had come off of a successful um, capital campaign and I think, I think she worked for the fellow who, who ran the capital campaign, but at any rate, not a single foundation grant proposal had been written. They had membership in a lo lot of community organizations, but they hadn't done anything with it. And the fellow who had spearheaded the capital campaign, he had died and none of those records were available to me. And their, uh, their fundraising appeal, they did a yearly appeal. It had been on a five-year decline. It had been outsourced to, I don't know how many different mail houses. And anytime they'd sent out an appeal, they were on the phone for days with complaints, seriously. It was a mess. And our donor base was an older donor base and they, they were actually dying, literally dying. So what I did, and this was very fluky because I had no trading in fundraising. I had worked for a foundation for the past seven years. All I knew how to do really was to write a grant proposal. I think I got this idea out of a marketing book, but I sent out, I went into our database, found 20 loyal donors who had given every year for the past five years and keep in mind, they'd given every year without any kind of stewardship whatsoever, without ever hearing back. All they got was that ask in the mail once a year. I wrote this simple little letter of introduction. I asked them why they had supported us. And I sent it out along with a really short survey and a stamp self-addressed envelope. 18 out of those 20 replied. Several sent in checks, even though I hadn't asked for money. Three became major donors. And less than two years later, we received our first bequest gift in the form of a check for $250,000. So this was Cindy's experience when she, she tried that letter. She mailed out 86 letters.
Um, let's see. She brought in over a thousand dollars. Sarah, who works with an animal shelter in Vermont. And she actually just started getting responses to hers. But more important, more important than the money was how that survey, that first survey, really helped me to understand that it isn't so much about you. It is about your donor's big why, their reasons for giving. And I got to tell you, it's one of the most exciting things you can get into when you, when you start really discovering why your donors give and you start, to, you, you start creating real relationships with them. So let's do a quick recap. Begin by taking steps to create your healthy organizational culture. Then you go into discovery, meet and greet, reviewing your data, your ask, thank, report systems, and your fundraising plan. Is that all? It's not. I love this quote. You, you are exactly enough as you are, whether you believe it or not. You really do have this already. I love this from um, Paul Nazareth, who is an amazing Canadian fundraiser. He tweeted this about a year ago. What non-fundraising job did you have where you learned a skill that has been in invaluable to you in your work? Denisa Caseman, who is one of the most brilliant international fundraisers in the world, she said event catering taught her project management making the customer experience smooth and pleasant because you, you want to be thinking about your donor experience. I loved Clay's understanding emotional emotion and motivation, how to work as a team. Show me a theater veteran and I'll show you some someone intrinsically well-trained and ready to be a fundraiser. See, you got these skills already is my point. Lisa found that her skills in journalism And yeah, the service industry. If you've ever worked as a waiter or waitress, you know this. I just want to say that that you are doing beautiful, beautiful work in the world. And um, however I can help you, I'm here for you. Thanks for being here today. I see we only have. A few minutes left. I wanted to actually, let me go ahead and, but it looks like we've got some questions. Yes, we do. Uh, before we do the questions here, to, uh, Pamela does, uh, Pamela, do you want to talk about your fundraising calendar real quick and then? Uh, and oh, then sure, sure. If you would like, to, we, we actually do a um, fundraising and marketing calendar every year. It's at thefundraisingcalendar.com. And if you go there now, you can download the one. We've still got, what, four months left of this year? And we'll be publishing a new one in 2023. Pamela reached out to me a couple of weeks ago and she's already starting for 2023. So I get on that <laughs> list for 2022. And I'm sure when the 2023 one is out there, uh, you'll be able to download it as well. Um, before we jump into the q and I'm going to have Sarah uh, pop up a quick poll here. And Pamela, if you want to stop, um, stop sharing. We probably can, we can uh, migrate back over to the poll and I'm going to go ahead and turn my video, my video back on. But if you would like uh, to learn more about today's speakers um, uh, for Pamela from Bluebring or from both of us, feel free to go ahead and respond to that poll. Uh, and someone from uh, one of our teams will reach out here afterwards. And so let's, um, we'll keep that poll up for a couple more Minute, a minute or two, um, let's go to the Q&A. One of the questions that popped up here a couple of times, Pamela, was um, the Train Your Board book that you referenced. People are having a hard time finding it or it's like listed uh, for $100 or more on Amazon. Is there, ah. do you know if it's still being printed or is it just out of print and you just got to try and find it? Gosh, a I've got about six of them here. You know, I'm actually friends with um, that publishing house and I'll, I'll ask them 
Okay. All right. Cool. Have you? That's a, such out? a great book. It's such a shame. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. All right. So we got that. So uh, we'll pop in here. Um, so we had a couple questions when we were talking about budget, right? You had that slide up around budget. Mm -hmm. and, um, one of them here was I've been in so many uh, situations where the staff leader at the top, either the CEO or the executive director, is super resistant to learning about fund development practices. Um, do you hear about this often? And um, what do you suggest in that situation? Well, anonymous, um, anonymous attending. Um, if you haven't already, do do we actually have those handouts here or are they going out later? Uh, Sarah's going to send them out later this afternoon. Okay. Definitely check out the handouts because there are a lot of good ideas in that in that one on building your culture it really it really does take a commitment to it you kind of you have to focus on on that culture aspect because it's it's pretty critical to everything else but you'll find a lot of ideas in there that is great feedback um, what would be a successful, so Dana asks, what would be a successful budget for a development? What percentage is good? So if, if half a percent is not good, what should, what should folks be um, aiming for? That's a good question. And I'm not sure I know the answer. I, um, I think it varies really. I so. think it really does. It's probably, it's another one of those you know, I interviewed Mal Warwick years ago. He was one of my first interviews and I was so thrilled to talk to him. And throughout the, throughout our interview, we, I did a little podcast with him. He kept saying, it depends. And I thought it was kind of a cop out, but the, the longer I'm in the sector, the more I see that it depends is usually the answer. Right. Um, that's good. That's good. I'll, small world, Mal, Mal Warwick was my very first internship at his direct mail. Oh. Oh, get <laughs> out oh you're so lucky he's such a yeah. sweetheart too isn't he yeah yeah that's that small world right small little fundraising world um all right so i'm a founder of a fairly so dan asks again i'm a founder of a fairly new organization and we are in the hiring process of a development specialist i want to be sure we are setting them up for success do you have any tips for dana on setting up a new development uh employee for success Hmm. That is a really good question. I'm actually, I'm actually just brought on a new, new client who is doing that. Um, I think they had some, some heavy duty turnover in the last couple of years. So they want to make sure they're, you really, you really need to make sure that you've got those systems in place, even, even if you outsource them for the first year. And that's one thing I've discovered the last three or four years that a lot of organizations probably should be outsourcing more. Outsourcing either your, cause I always did it all. I did the grants, I did the individual giving, I did the database manager, but a lot of times it makes sense either to have your communications outsourced or to have your, your grants outsourced, but get those systems in place. Perfect. And that's going to really help with your, oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, Sarah asked, does Bloomering have a webinar to show how to do donor segment segmenting? I am pretty confident we do. It would be under yeah. our Academy section. So Sarah, if you go to the website and go under resources and Bloomering Academy, there's a number of uh, webinar recordings on how to actually get in there and, and use the software. So um, great question there. Thanks. Thanks for asking it. Uh, Let's see here. Um, here's an interesting one about sort of general about sustaining programs. Do you recommend having incentives for monthly donors? Um, you get a t-shirt after 15 gifts, uh, Zoom with the founder, 50 gifts, et cetera, et cetera. Do you, what is, um, what's your take on uh, incentives um, around uh, sustaining, sustaining programs? You know, I'm not really, overall a fan of incentives but you probably you probably could find more information on that over on Erica Wasdorp's site I always refer everyone to uh, who's working on their monthly giving program to Erica she's written two of the best books on monthly giving and she's it's all she teaches oh I see I see we got a Philadelphian 
Yeah, awesome. Someone uh, from Holland, Michigan. My yeah. aunt's in Holland. <laughs> Well, uh, unfortunately, we're, we're going to have to wrap it up. I did want to add uh, to that last question. We, um, I was, uh, we were at, with the donor, donor relations guru <laughs> last week, um, and she, she echoes uh, that sentiment, that incentives, I think, are not, um, so sort of sometimes can be the wrong, send the wrong reason, right? Um, and I think a lot, of, um, a lot of people give not so much for the incentive, but just because they want to give. Uh, and so it, it's not necessarily needed. Um, at any rate, I know we had a lot more questions. So Pamela, um, what we'll do is we'll send them over to you um, along with the folks' email addresses. So if you have time or a minute, um, perhaps uh, you can send some uh, respond. Otherwise, we can, um, get the, we can try and respond to as many as possible. Sure, in, um, I'm happy to. Okay, and perfect. and you know, I mean, I could even maybe put them together for a blog post if there's enough. Perfect. Or what we can do is put them on the landing page with this video. So if people had uh, questions, Super. attack that, um, put that on there. Uh, again, folks, uh, you'll be getting the recording here shortly uh, later this afternoon. Uh, we'll get that out there with the link out for uh, to watch the recording as well as the slides. Um, it was truly our pleasure. We do these webinars every Thursday. Uh, so make sure to check your email for um, upcoming webinars that we have on the books. Uh, with that, it, to Pamela, thank you again for joining us and thank you for um, taking the time to spend the afternoon, the, this hour with our um, dedicated fundraisers. Uh, until next time, everyone, have a wonderful day and uh, happy fundraising. Thank you so much. This was so much fun. All right. Take care. Have now. a good one. Bye-bye.